Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Rus Copernicus webinar. My name is Miguel Castro, and today I will be guiding you through this exercise in which we will be using Snappy, a Python module that allows you to process Copernicus data directly in a Python environment. For those of you that don't know Snappy, you have to know that this is a Python module that comes with your Snap installation, and as I said, which allows you to process Copernicus data in a Python environment directly. Today, I will be doing the exercise using Sentinel-1 data for the example, but this tool can be used for other Copernicus missions. So before starting, let me tell you the objectives of this session. You will learn two main things. First of all, how to use Snappy and how to process Sentinel-1 data in this case. And secondly, what is the Rus Copernicus project and how it can help you in your projects with Copernicus data. So just before starting, um, be aware that this webinar is being recorded and that you will be able to repeat this exercise later on by yourself by registering as a Rus Copernicus user. So very briefly about the outline of this session. The complete webinar should last around one hour and I have divided the session in four parts. First of all, I will introduce you to the Rus Copernicus service, the project that is hosting this series of webinars. Then I will very briefly describe the Sentinel-1 mission, which uh, we will use to run our exercise. And then after the introduction of Sentinel-1, I will go into the Rus Copernicus virtual machine and I will run my exercise. At the very end, we will save some time to answer all your questions, so we will have a Q&A session. Since we are a large group today, I kindly ask you to send your questions as soon as possible using the questions tab of GoToWebinar. Do not wait until the end to make sure that we can answer all of them. Okay, so let's get started and let's do so by um, introducing the Rus Copernicus service. So Rus stands for Research and Use Support for Sentinel Core Products. This is a project or an initiative founded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency, with the objective to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support R&D activities. The service provides a free and open scalable platform in a powerful computing environment, hosting a suite of open source toolboxes which are pre-installed on virtual machines and which allow you to handle and process data derived from these Sentinel satellites. So what does that mean? Well, the, the thing is that with the large amount of data produced by these Sentinel satellites, the challenge is no longer data availability in Earth observation, but rather storage and processing capacity. So to solve that, Rus Copernicus offers virtual machines so that you have the appropriate computing environment to handle the data. But in addition uh, to all that, Rus also provides specialized user help desk to support your remote sensing activities. So if you have questions, you can contact us about uh, Copernicus data processing. And at the same time, we organize training activities, which are formed by webinars and face-to-face -face events. Webinars, such as the one we are doing right now, or face-to-face -face events, which, as you can imagine, due to the current situation, they are postponed. So you can find all the information about the project and how to register in our websites. The first one on the left, ruscopernicus.eu, it's the website of the project in which you will be able to register as a user, get to know the project better, and have all the information. On the second one, the one on the right, it's the website we have dedicated for our training activities. It is here where you will find the news about upcoming events, uh, deadlines, registrations for webinars, for whenever we have a, a new face-to-face, -face, for face-to-face -face events as well, and so on. So I recommend you, you have a look later on once you have time. So as I said, the webinar is being recorded this is a question we get uh, quite often. So yes, we record the webinars and we put them freely available on our YouTube channel. So here you can see a screenshot. If you have more interest in learning about Copernicus data processing or other applications, I recommend you, you check our YouTube channel. We have a long list of topics already covered. I'm sure you can find something that might be useful for you. We also upload our webinars in our Roost training platform. So if you go here, you will find them. And the only thing that's different from the YouTube channel is that here you will find a document summarizing the Q&A session of that webinar that you're watching. So for example, for today, once we have the Q&A, we will summarize all your questions and we will put them available in this website. You know already that questions from others might be relevant for yourself as well. 
OK, so let's uh, move on. And let's now talk very briefly about the Sentinel-1 mission. So for this exercise, we will be using C-band SAR data provided by the Sentinel-1 satellite. The Sentinel satellites are included in the space component of the Copernicus program, which is a program of the European Commission and of the European Space Agency. So the Sentinel-1 mission is formed by a constellation of two twin satellites, so Sentinel-1A and B, which are faced at each other at 180 degrees. As you can see on the animation, this is mainly to improve the temporal resolution of the system. And it is an active sensor, so we are emitting radiation, which works on the C-band. And it provides data with a short repeat cycle and with different imaging holds. If you are new to Sentinel-1 and you didn't know, Sentinel-1 has different imaging modes, so different ways in which the products can be acquired. But those are, this is a parameter that is by default set by ESA and it's not up to the user. If you want to know more about the characteristics the technical characteristics of the Sentinel-1 mission, I recommend you to check the technical documentation released by ESA on this regard. Okay, another thing I want to mention about the Sentinel-1 mission is its naming convention. You know, if you have worked with Copernicus data before, the product names are quite long, and this, of course, follows a logic. It follows a naming convention, which is standard, and gives you already a lot of information about the products you are working with. And why is this relevant in this specific exercise and why I want to put the focus on this is because when you work operationally with the data, when you start to process a lot of images, at some point it might be useful that you extract part of the metadata information that is contained in the product name to use it in your processing routines and to keep track of things and so on. So I want to be sure that we are all understand the very long names that we can see here. If you know already, then this is just a, a recap. If this is the first time you're introduced to the naming convention of Sentinel-1 products, then it's a good chance. Know that this applies also for the other Sentinel missions. Of course, the meaning of the name is different, but they also follow a specific naming convention that I recommend you to check whenever you have time. So what do we find first on this very long product name? In this case, I'm using as example the product we are going to use in today's exercise. Um, so let's have a look. First of all, you will find what is called the mission identifier. So if the product comes from the Sentinel 1A or B satellite, then you will find the mode beam. So in which acquisition mode the product you are dealing with has been acquired. Remember, this can be interferometric wide, EW, uh, SM, etc. Then we have the product type, so SLC, GRD, or OCEAN. OCEAN. Remember, and a small clarification here, SLC stands for single look complex. This is the data type you need if you want to do interferometric applications. Why? Because it contains not only the amplitude information of the radar signal, but also the phase information, which is what you use in interferometric applications. If you are not interested in interferometric applications, then go directly to GRT products, which stands for Ground Range Detected. Those are products that are already multi load and they contain only the amplitude information. They are a little bit less heavy than SLC products as well. And then we have ocean products, which are uh, foreseen for marine applications. There you will find information about uh, wind retrievals and so on. OK, next thing you can uh, find on the name is the resolution class. This is something that only applies for GRT products, but basically it means that you are getting a full, medium, or high uh, uh, product in terms of, of resolution. Then you will find the processing level, 0, 1, or 2. 0 stands for raw data. So this is the data that comes directly from the satellite. And in Sentinel-1, level 0 is not available for users. Um, uh, directly. Then we have level one, which can be SLC or GRT. And then level two, that stands for the, that applies for the ocean products. Okay, then this is followed by the product class, which can be either standard or annotation. This is something that is used internally by the uh, PDGS of uh, Sentinel-1, so nothing that worries you. And then this is followed by another key parameter, which is the polarization. Remember, Sentinel-1 is a dual pole satellite. So you can have different combinations, either single or dual. If it's dual, it's going to be either HH or HV or BD plus VH. 
Again, as for the acquisition modes, the polarization configuration of the mission is set by default by ESA. So depending on where you are, where your study area is located on the, on the Earth, let's say, you will find a specific configuration. This is something that is predefined. And as I said, it's not up to the user, but up to the decision made by ESA here. Okay, following the polarization, you will find the product start and stop date times. So from when to when the product was acquired. So when you do a, a query on a, to download the product, it is here where you will find that information. This is, you can find here the date, so year, month, day. Then it's followed by a T, which is a, 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 a character without any meaning. And it's used to separate the date from the time. So here you see it, hours, minutes, seconds, and then hours, minutes, seconds. As you can see, it took around yeah, 20 some seconds to, to take this product. Okay, then this is followed by the absolute orbit number. So in the orbit reference in which the product was acquired. Do not confuse this with the relative orbit number. That is a parameter that you will see when you do a, a search for Sentinel-1 products in the Copernicus Open Access Hub. I will go back to this once where in the exercise where I will show you how to download the products. Then this is followed by the mission data take and the product unique identifier, which is a parameter that's not repeated in any product and that allows you to uh, have unique IDs for the products. Okay, so I think this is uh, clear now. We all know what's the meaning of all this very long name and we can continue. So let's now move to the exercise. And I'm going to move to the Rus Copernicus virtual machine, where I will show you, first of all, how to download the data, in case this is the first time you are seeing it. And then we will start the exercise in Python using Snappy to process Sentinel-1 data. So once you become a Rus Copernicus user, you will receive a link to your virtual machine, a link that you can open in any internet browser. Today, I'm using Google Chrome. So let me just go full screen here. So with the link of the virtual machine, you will receive also the credentials to access your cloud environment. So I'm just going to access mine. And what you will see once you are in the virtual machine is an interface that is very similar to a regular computer. I'm saying this for those of you that are new to cloud environments and this way of, of working. In the case of the Rus Copernicus VMs, those are Linux-based cloud environments. They are sitting in the cloud being backed up by a resources in terms of storage and processing. So we have a powerful computing environment here, which already comes with a predefined list of software installed. You can see, for example, we have Snap, which is, a, let's say, kind of standard to process Copernicus data, or at least is the official, is a software to process Copernicus data. But not only we have graphical user interface software, but also developing environments for R, in this case, R Studio. Uh, you can also find Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, we have the Anaconda distribution installed, so you have access to Spider. And of course, remember in Rus Copernicus, you have full administration rights. So if you want to install any software, then it's completely up to you and that's completely fine. So this is a virtual machine. And as you can see, you have everything you would expect in a regular computer, not only the software, but also a file manager to go around and save your files and also a dedicated web browser within the virtual machine. So now I want to show you how to download Copernicus data, more in particular Sentinel-1 data. And for this, I'm going to use the official access point to Copernicus data from the Commission and ESA, which is the Copernicus Open Access Hub. From here, from this uh, website, you can access the full archive of Copernicus data. And in this case, I'm going to click on the Open Hub. And once here, I will show you how to download Copernicus data in case uh, you don't know. So the first thing you have to do is to create an account in the Copernicus Open Access Hub. It is free, it is fast, and uh, very quickly you can be ready to download products. I already have mine, so let me just log in. Here you can sign up, by the way. Okay, once you are logged in, you have to define, first of all, your region of interest. For today's exercise, we are going to take an image over the Netherlands as example. So I'm just going to navigate around here, and this is the area I'm interested on. So in order to define that region of interest, I need to draw a polygon on the map. And for this, I can switch to the drawing mode and now draw a polygon. So this is going to be my region of interest, more or less. 
And now I need to set some parameters to send my query to the Copernicus Open Access Hub. So the first thing is the sensing period, from when to when we want our product. In this case, let's have a look, for example, from the 1st of April until 15th of April, so mid-May, uh, mid-month, sorry. Once you have defined the sensing period, then we need to specify from which mission we want to do the query about. In this case, you can see we have Sentinel-1, 2, and 3, but today we're interested on Sentinel-1. So I check the mission and start to define these search parameters. Some of them are mandatory, some of them are redundant. I'll tell you why. First of all, the satellite platform. So here you can choose if you want products from either Sentinel-1A or Sentinel-1B. In our case, we don't care. It's uh, not a distinguishment we want to do today, so I will leave it empty. This means that both will be taken into account. The product type is actually the parameter you have to set, and it's here where you have to choose from an SLC product. Remember, for interferometric applications, a GRD product, for non-interferometric applications, and for Ocean, in case you're interested in that. Today, I'm going to do the example of processing Sentinel-1 in SNAPI using a GRD product, but you could do it also with uh, SLC or with Sentinel-2 and so on. So, GRD. Then the polarization. So remember in my slides, I mentioned that Sentinel-1 is a dual pole satellite and you, there are different polarization combinations available. However, the configuration of the satellite in which the products are acquired is predefined by ESAM. So depending on where your region of interest is located in the world, you will have a predefined configuration for the polarization. So I would recommend you to leave this option empty so that you take everything into account. But I can tell you already that you will get VV and VH in this part of the world. Only in polar regions, you can get HH, HV. So I recommend you to leave it empty. Then the sensing mode. In this case, it's the same. There is a predefined configuration in terms of acquisition mode. And overland, the default way is interferometric wide. In over oceans, over coastal areas, or over uh, very seismic areas, uh, you can find other um, acquisition modes, but let's say generally over land you will find interferometric wide. You could set it or you can just leave it empty and take everything into consideration. Let's do it like that. Then we have the relative orbit number. When I was explaining you the naming convention of Sentinel-1, I told you do not confuse the absolute number, the absolute orbit number with the relative orbit number. The absolute one is just a number that uh, every time there is an orbit completed by the satellite, it gets increased, and that's all. The relative orbit number makes reference to the specific orbit that the, uh, the satellite is following in its repeat cycle. This is a relevant parameter where, when you are working in interferometric applications. And why? Because it guarantees you that if you look for products with the same relative orbit, you will have the same acquisition geometry. And this is a key feature when you are doing interferometric applications since you want products to be as similar as possible in order to compare the phase information. Anyway, today we are not doing interferometry, so I will not go too much into, into this, or not, not more. So let's leave it empty. Once you have these parameters set, let's click the search button and see the result. Okay, we got back the list of products that match our query. And as you can see, we have 22. And following the what we know from the naming convention, you can see that we have both products from Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B. I can tell you they are all interferometric wide. If you go down on the list, uh, you will see they are all interferometric wide. And of course, GRT, since this is what we define. Also, Pay attention here, DV, so dual vertical, meaning VV and VH for the polarization configuration. As you can see, this is the, uh, the settings, the default settings, let's say, that you will get. Okay, so the question is now how to download the products. Well, there are different ways, different ways to, to do this in a graphical manner or maybe automatizing steps using download manager scripts and so on. However, for today's exercise, I don't want to put too much uh, I don't want to go too much into different topics and make the, the exercise more complicated for those of you that are new. So I will not go into that. I just want to mention that 
In a regular way, in a standard way, you would download a product by clicking on this arrow. This starts a download process in your browser and you will get your product downloaded in your folder as any other file you download from the internet. This file, for example, is around almost one gigabyte, not, not much. Um, if you compare that to SLC products, they are much heavier and there you can expect files of several gigabytes. Okay, so I'm going to cancel the download. I don't need the product. I have already, I have already downloaded the product. So just gonna close everything and now we can start with the exercise. So for today's exercise, we are going to use a Jupyter Notebook. More than good, I'm going to run, I'm going to run a Jupyter Notebook in Jupyter Lab. I'll, I'll give you an introduction to that later on. And I'm going to do so using Jupyter from an Anaconda environment. So I'm going to use an Anaconda distribution of Python. So if those concepts are new to you, don't worry, I will cover them now very briefly. Also, another note that I want to pass you is that I am, if you are repeating this exercise, I'm going to show you how to proceed, assuming that the Snappy installation is already working in your virtual machine. So I will not go into installation procedure, as I think this might complicate things. Of course, I will leave you at the end of the webinar with some references where you can find all this information. So before going into Python, Anaconda, and Jupyter and everything, I just want to give you an overview of the exercise. So today we are going to run the exercise from this specific folder that's located in the SPAT, Shared Training Py01 Center 1 Processing Snappy. And here you can find all the files relevant to this exercise. In the AUX data folder is where I have placed basically my Jupyter notebook. In the original folder, as you can imagine, I have the data, the file that I'm going to be using for today's exercise. You can see here, it's a product, a Sentinel-1A GRD a GRD product from April this year. And in the processing folder, I will be storing all the outputs that we are going to generate. So with this introduction done, let me now quickly talk about Anaconda and Jupyter and what uh, all this is in case you are new to this. Well, Anaconda is a free and open source distribution of the Python and R programming languages for scientific computing, which aims to simplify package management and deployment. Uh, there are different ways you can work in Python. I would recommend you to, to work on Anaconda. I think it's great mainly for, for package management and to make sure that you are running your projects always with uh, an environment where you know the, the versions of the modules and, and so on. So let's say via Anaconda, we access Python and we make sure that we manage our environment using the resources of Anaconda. Then from this Anaconda environment, we are going to run JupyterLab. So um, what is JupyterLab and what is Jupyter Notebook? Well, the Jupyter Notebook is an open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain live code, equations, visualizations, and narrative text. Notebook documents contain both computer code, such as Python code, but not only, and rich elements, such as paragraphs, equations, figures, and so on. So notebooks documents are both human readable documents containing the analysis, description, and the results, as well as executable documents, which can be run to perform data analysis. So in this context, of course, I will leave you also at the end with references to to more information about Jupyter and Anaconda in case uh, you are new to these terms. But in this context, let me now launch my Jupyter notebook. And for that, I'm going to, first of all, activate my Conda environment. This is something that you can do either from the Anaconda Navigator GUI, so from the graphical interface of Anaconda, or also from Terminal. And for this, I'm going to, first of all, activate my Conda environment. And I just write Conda activate, and then the name of the environment from which I want to run the exercise. In this case, I call the environment snappy env. Then you press enter to run the line. And as you can see now, we get back that we are in this specific Conda environment. And from here, I have installed in this environment Jupyter Lab in advance. So I'm going to just run Jupyter, sorry, Jupyter Lab, and it will launch. So the Jupyter Lab, it's let's say the next evolution of the Jupyter Notebook project. It has different advantages versus standard Jupyter Notebooks. I will not cover them, but I recommend you to, to check. One of the things we get in Jupyter Lab is a file browser. So 
From here, we can navigate our folders and access the specific notebook we want to open. Remember, I said before, I have stored the notebook in the exercise folder, so in this one, by through one Sentinel one processing snappy, and then AUX data. From here, you can just launch a notebook by double clicking on it. So we have already this. I'm just going to resize my windows. I'm going to do full screen as well in my browser in the virtual machine, and we can start. So this is the Jupyter Notebook we are going to use for this exercise. And as I said before, one of the great advantages of using Jupyter Notebooks when sharing code is that you can combine it with rich text elements. In this case, for example, images, links, and so on. So for those of you repeating this webinar later, I would recommend you to read the information I have put here at the beginning. But for now, we can just skip it because it's basically a repetition of what I've said already in my presentation. So just to point out that I am leaving you here with some links to some tutorials that I think might be useful if you are new to Python or Jupyter Notebooks. I think this can be interesting. Anyway, I will put it in my in the slides of this uh, recorded webinar at the end. So. Let's move on, and the first thing I want uh, to discuss with you is the way I have divided the exercise. So first of all, I will give you a very brief overview of the Python modules I'm going to use for this exercise. I will then uh, declare a user-defined function so that we have it ready to use during the script. This is basically because there is a specific task that I need to run every time. And in order to avoid duplications in my script, I prefer to create a function in advance and then call it later on. Once we have all this ready, all these settings ready, we will be ready to start using Snappy. So in this case, I'm using Sentinel-1 as an example to show you how to use Snappy. But of course, a similar approach would uh, follow if you are processing Sentinel-2 data or Sentinel-3. Of course, the operators would need to change. So as you can see, we are going to run a standard, kind of standard processing chain to produce analysis-ready data from Sentinel-1, meaning that uh, once you run this task or this chain, the output that you get is most of the times, let's say, ready to be used as input in any application like flood mapping, deforestation, and so on. Okay, so let's uh, get started and let's do so by talking about the modules I'm going to use in this exercise. By the way, and as you can see, in Jupyter Notebooks, we have two types of cells mainly. One, and the most important, are the code cells. And you can see here it's written uh, code. So this is an executable cell where I write my Python script, and this is the cell where I run the script. The others are, let's say, markdown cell, where I put my text, images, links, and I add my narrative, let's say, to, to share the code. So, a few notes on how to run the code cells in Jupyter. You can either click on the cell you want to run and then press Control Enter or Shift Enter. You can also Jupyter Lab play the press the play button, or you can go to the uh, to the run menu and just use one of the run options you have here. Okay. Anyway, let's um, move on and talk about the modules I'm going to use. Well, if you are familiar with Python. You can see that I'm going to be using matplotlib to do some visualizations. Then I'm going to use zip file, OS, and glob to do some uh, file managing, so to access file in my files in my virtual machine and so on. Then I will be using the very well-known and standard Python libraries of pandas and numpy to do some data analysis and data manipulation. Then I will use the subprocess library to send external calls to system, that is to send uh, commands to the terminal from Python. And then, of course, I will be importing the Snappy library, which is the uh, module that will give us access to the operators of Snap in Python, and also to the uh, JPy library, which is a Python Java bridge. So why I'm saying this about uh, Java and so on? Well, you have to know, in case you, you don't know, that the Snap implementation language is Java. And therefore, the Snap native API is a Java API. And it is possible to use the Snap Java API from Python by making use of the Snappy module, which, let's say, act as a bridge, let's say, between the Python interface and the 
Java API that is running on the background. And for that, as I said, we use Snappy, but also JPy, which is a standard Python Java bridge. Okay, so this is my setting. Now let's, uh, let's run it and let's move on. So if we don't get any error, that means that all the modules have been called and they are all loaded and ready to use. So the next thing is, as I said, declaring a user-defined user function. In this case, it's only one. This is mainly to facilitate the processing of data and to avoid code duplications. So this function that I'm declaring here, it's called output view. And it's a function that is going to create visualizations of process Sentinel-1 data. So in every step of our processing chain, I will want to visualize the output of every step. And in order to visualize it, I'm going, I have created a, a function that will do the, the job for me. So as you can see, it takes a long list of inputs. And I just want to give you here a quick overview of them. First of all, it takes as input a product. So the, let's say the, the data you want to visualize. And this has to be something that comes out of Snappy. So uh, a GPF product. I will talk more about this later. Then you have to specify from that product which bands you want to visualize. And then I am here giving the option to set the minimum and maximum value of the color stretch. You know that when you open an image in Python by default, the color stretching is going to happen between the minimum and the maximum value of, of your image. So the full range, let's say. However, this might not be a good idea, especially when working in SAR, since we might have outliers that have a backscatter that is very, very high. But let's say the distribution of the data is um, not equivalent in the complete range. So you might want to change the minimum and the maximum value to fit the colors in the region of interest. There are different techniques to do so. In, um, in There are different techniques. You can use this histogram stretch. Uh, you can use a histogram to, to, let's say, clip uh, certain values and so on. Here, I'm using a manual approach in which, in which you as user set those values manually. Of course, I'm giving you the option. I mean, you are free to, to change that and to uh, create your own solutions. Anyway, I don't want to go too much into the details of this specific function because there are many ways you can do this in, in Python. This is just one way. And uh, I think it's not the relevant part of this exercise. So anyway, we. Uh, we have here this function. I'm going to run the cell so that it gets created. I get here my confirmation in this number two. It was executed, and now we can continue. So we are now in the part where we are going to run Snappy. And here the question is, or the, the question you may have is, which operations, which algorithms are available in uh, Snappy so that I can process my data? Well, I would say, or I would recommend you that the easiest, the easiest way to have a look to the operators that are available in Snappy is actually to call GPT and have a look to the list of operators there. So you can call GPT. Remember, GPT is the graph processing tool of Snap. And you can call GPT via command line, but also you can do it directly from Python using this subprocess library. And uh, the way you do it is that you call GPT, then H, the parameter H for, let's say, help. And then you can either add the name of a specific operator if you want to access the information of that specific operator, or if you remove this and you just run it without that, you will access the information or the, the help information of the tool itself. So let's run it first of all like this and have a look. So what we will get back is the same as you would get via terminal, but just in Python. I think it's more convenient to stay in one place. So we get information about the usage of GPT, the description, and so on. I will not go into the details of this since we have other Cruise Copernicus webinars on the use of GPT. So I, I, I would redirect you there so if you want to know more about the usage of GPT. But the relevant part I want to point out here is that if you go down in this, um, in this uh, result, we access the section of operators. In here, you can see all the names, all the operators are available in GPT, in Snap, and of course, also via Snappy. In the end, the Snappy is just accessing, is a, a module that gives us access to, let's say, the, the Snap engine, and, and that's pretty much all. So you see here the operators, and as you can see, there's a long list that contains 
algorithms to process not only Sentinel-1 data, but also Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 as, let's say, in the typical SNAP GUI. So if you're interested, for example, in a specific in a specific operator, let's say, for example, the subset operator, you can access this specific operator by copying its name. And in the call you do, instead of writing uh, GPTH, you can just add the name of the operator and run the, the cell again. This will access the information, as I said, of the operator, and it will give you something very important, which is the list of parameters that this operator uh, has. So description, the uh, well, takes a source, uh, an input product, and here you can see the different parameters, for example, copy metadata, uh, geo region, region uh, and so on. Well, this is just to demonstrate you how you can call GPT from um, from Python, and how you can get the list of operators available in Snappy via the GPT call in uh, in the terminal. I will come back to this later, but so far let's uh, continue. So once we know which operators are available in Snappy and how to have a look to them, let's talk about the processing chain we are going to use today. So we will take our data, and as you can see on the graph here, we will do a subset, we will update the orbits, terminal removal, calibration, speckle filtering, terrain correction, and finally, we will write our product back to a file. I will go into the details of every step and what they mean in standard processing uh, once I, I reach them. So let's now focus on the first one, which is the read operator. So uh, how are we going to proceed? Well, first of all, I am uh, going to declare a variable that's going to be called product path, in which I set the folder in my virtual machine where I have my products. Remember, this is exactly the same one as I have shown you before. So if I just go back here, I am pointing here to this specific folder, uh, sorry, here. So I'm just saying, okay, my data is in this folder, pretty much. Okay, once I do so, I'm going to create a Python list where I, I'm going to list basically all the files that I have in that folder that follow a specific pattern. And the pattern is defined here, sentinel1 asterisk.zip. What I'm saying here to the computer, let's say, is go to that folder that I'm telling you, so this one here, product path, and find any file that starts with S1 then the name is followed by whatever, and that's what this asterisk, asterisk means here. And then it should finish by .zip. So basically this specific task here is taking advantage of the fact that we know Sentinel products follow a naming convention. So we can take advantage of that and say, I know all my files are going to start all with, always with S1, and they will always finish with uh, .zip, if that's a standard format. So I create a list out of that. And then what I'm going to do is, out of that list, for every element of that list, I'm going to extract some metadata to get to know my products a little bit more before going into the processing. So what we are going to do is extract from the product name the sensing mode, also the product type, and the polarization. This from the product name. Then we are going to start working with Snappy, and more in particular, we are going to call the function within Snappy, the function product IO and read product. So I'm going to take from all the elements of that list that I'm going to create. In this case, I only have one product, but I'm just saying that because if you have more products in, in your folder, it will work the same. So it's going to take that product in my list and it's going to import it in, Sna in uh, Python with Snappy. And I'm going to save that in the S1 read variable. Once I have it there, I'm going to extract the name from the metadata of, of this variable. And I'm also going to access the raster dimensions, so the height and width, and also the band names. Remember, with Sentinel-1, we get intensity and amplitude, in this case, VV and VH. And you, you may know already that intensity and amplitude are related in SAR. So one is the square of the other. Once we get all this metadata, we are going to create a pandas data frame, so very common structure in Python. And finally, I am going to show you a quick look of the product. In case you don't know, Sentinel-1 products come with a quick look 
in the product uh, in, the, in the folder. And this is something you can access within the, so you, you would need to unzip the folder, access the preview subfolder, and there you will find the file quicklook.png. This is basically a, a quick look of the image. Uh, in this case, a false color composition in the case of Sentinel-1. And this allows you to give you, it allows you to, to have a look before starting to process the data to, to how it, it looks like. I'm, using, I'm taking advantage of the zip file library in Python, which allows me to access zip, fold, zip uh, files and then extract a specific file inside, in this case, the quick look. So let's run this and have a look to the result. And as you can see, what we get back is basically what I've explained. First of all, a data frame, so a table, let's say, you are new to Python, which contains the name of the products in my folder. In this case, I only have one, so only one. The sensing mode of this product, product type, polarization, raster dimensions here, and the list of bands that is available in this product. In this case, amplitude VH, intensity VH, and the same for VV. And here we have a look to this quick look that comes with every Sentinel-1 file. And as you can see, it gives you a quick overview of, of how it looks like. Remember, this is a SAR product. It's just a false color composition and that is generated. I would say quick looks are more important or relevant when you work with optical data. Let's imagine this is an optical image and you download it with a 50% cloud cover. Well, maybe your study area was not covered by clouds. And a good way of having a look to this is by having a look to the quick look, first of all, in your processing chain to validate that folder, that image and avoid processings that are not needed. So I think this yeah, is where the quick looks come at, um, are, are, are useful. For SAR, I think it's just nice to see, and, and that's all. Anyway, our study area, our region of interest is going to be located in this region of the image. So that's uh, how we are going to do it. Okay, so let's get started. And uh, if you remember my graph, the next thing after the read is the subset. So let's do it. Well, how do we do the subset? Well, first of all, I do the subset at the beginning of my processing chain to uh, avoid long processing times in my in the upcoming steps. So I recommend you to do it at the beginning. Another thing to point out about the subset is that we are going to do it using pixel coordinates. You can do it using geographical coordinates. In this case, I, I think it's uh, more convenient to do it with, since it's just a demo with um, pixel coordinates. But uh, just to let you know that there is also the possibility to use geographical coordinates. When you use pixel coordinates, you need to know that the reference pixel is going to be the upper right corner. So the coordinates of the upper right pixel are 0, 0. If you go down in Y or right in X, you will increase the, the value. So as you can see here, I'm defining my region of interest with, its, with the upper right corner of my region of interest in this specific X coordinate and Y coordinate, and then it's width and height. This will give me, let's say, a square that is going to be located, I'll tell you already, around this area. Okay, so here comes the first interaction we are going to have with Snappy, and please see you pay attention. So how does it work? Let's first of all focus on this specific line that I'm highlighting here. What I'm doing here is creating a Python variable called subset, and I'm saying subset is equal to. Then I'm calling the snappy library. And within the snappy library, I'm calling the GPF create product function. So what is this? Well, snap operators are available in snappy via the GPF create product function. The first parameter is a string denoting the name of the operator as denoted in the engine and available via GPT. What does that mean? It means that Whenever you want to call an operator in Snappy, you need to call this specific function from the Snappy module, GPF create product. Then you need to put the name of the operator you want to call, in this case, subset. And now the question is, which, how do I know which name should I put, et cetera, et cetera? Well, remember, I told you at the beginning that you can call GPT from terminal. And if you just write GPT slash H, you can access the full list of operators available 
And from there, you can take the name of the one you're interested on. So let's say you're interested in, I don't know, uh, PCA, then this would be the name you need to put. If you're interested in a reproject, then this one, and so on and so on. Okay, so we put the um, name of the operator. And in Snappy, we provide the parameters through the second GPF grid product parameter. So we put the name of subset, and this is followed by a variable called parameters, which contains the parameters of this subset operator. So what is this uh, parameters variable and where do we create it? Well, if you pay attention, we create it here above and let's go line by line. First of all, I declare my variable parameters and this is equal to snappy.hashmap. Um, so parameters is a Java hashmap object and this is an object that is in, in uh, Java equivalent to a Python dictionary. And the parameters here must be named exactly as set in GPT. So what we do is, first of all, we open a snappy object, in this case, a, a snappy hash map object. It's empty, let's say we have created so far. And now we are going to start passing some parameters, some parameters that should be the ones that the subset operator needs. Again, how do we know which parameters the subset operator needs? by going to GPT and calling that specific parameter. So if I go up, I can write here subset. And from the description of the operator, what I will see is the list of parameters that it has. So you see here, parameters option. Remember, all the parameters have um, a default value. So if you don't set them, they will go to their default value. In this case, I have here copy metadata, Boolean. So copy metadata is either true or false. And you see here the description of this specific parameter and its default value. So in this case, it's set to false. You see, for example, uh, geo region. So the subset region in geographical coordinates using well-known text format. Well, here you see already how to do it with geographical coordinates. In my case, I'm using the parameter region, and this is the subset region in pixel coordinates, and it has to follow the following format, x, y, width, and height. Okay, so this is how you can know which parameters you need to pass to every operator, so basically by calling it in, uh, in, in uh, GPT. And as you can see here, I'm first of all changing the copy metadata parameter from its default value, which we have seen it's false to true. So parameters dot put, and then the name of the parameter, copy metadata. Remember, this name of the parameter must be the same as what you see on GPT. And then since it's Boolean, then well, then true or false. Okay, then remember we had a look to the region, which allows us to provide the pixel coordinates of our subset. And then I just put, uh, the, the values in the order that it's asked, in this case, x, y, width, and height. So, and this comes from here. So, as you can see, this is how we do it. So, first of all, we create an empty hash map. We pass the specific parameters. Then we call the operator by using the snappy GPF create product function. And here we set the name of the operator we want to call, the parameters that this operator needs. And then finally, we fit the function with the product to which the operator has to be applied to. In this case, S1 read. S1 read comes from my data input here. This is the place where I define S1 read. And as you can see, it is importing my Sentinel-1 file that is stored in my, my folder. It's importing it to Python using Snappy, and I'm saving that in this variable S1 read. Of course, this code is optimized to work with one image, but you could optimize it to work with many images. This is completely up to your programming skills. Okay, once we do so, once we do the subset, we are ready to plot the result of it. And as you can see, I'm using the user function that I have declared before, output view. Remember, it has different parameters. 
first of all, the product that I want to visualize, in this case, the subset product, so this one here. Then I'm saying I want to visualize these bands, output bands, which I have defined here. And it's a list that contains the name of the bands I want to see. You can see the name of those bands in this line here. Actually, we are not going to visualize it because I didn't print it. But if you do like this, I, you, will, you will see it. So amplitude VV and amplitude VH, those are the bands I want to visualize. And then here, remember, I'm setting the mean and max values for my color stretch. Anyway, let's run it. And in that way, we can understand better how these numbers are working. Well, so right now what's happening is from Python via Snappy, we are calling the Snap engine, we are calling the subset operator, we are passing all the parameters and everything is going to happen and we will see the result. It takes a few seconds and there we go. Well, first of all, let's focus on this print here. This comes from, from here and as you can see, I am from the uh, subset variable that I have created here. I'm calling the get band names. And instead of just printing this directly, I'm putting it inside a list, a um, inside a Python list. Well, sometimes the outputs of, Na of Snappy will be integers or, or strings. However, you might sometimes walk into Java objects that, if you are new to Java, might, be, might, might seem foreign if you are a Python user. So the way to solve this is to put that Java object into a list or a string, depending on which one it is, and then you will be able to see it. I have then added the print just to, to see it. So what it's telling me is basically in the subset product, I have those bands, amplitude VH, intensity VH, and so on. And that's why here I have amplitude VH and VV, not the other way around. So once I have this, my function, the one we have defined before, is doing the work of creating the uh, visualization. And as you can see, uh, what this is we have done the subset. We are focusing on this region of our image. And I want here to, to put a pause and talk a little bit about the colors and how to interpret that. First of all, I wouldn't say uh, visual interpretation is a very good technique in, in SAR in general, um, let's say, generally speaking. But also when you do uh, this kind of color stretching, you have to be careful. As I said, there are different ways to do color stretching. You can do histogram, you can use the histogram to do your, your color stretch. You can clip the, the histogram and, and select some min and max values. You can automatize this by driving some statistics about the, 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 your pixel values, etc. When you compare images, the ideal scenario would be to use the same color stretch so that you can make sure that, that all the colors represent the, the same value in, in all the images. In our case, we are not using the same color stretch. As you can see, for VV, we are going from 41 to 286, and in VH, from 20 to 160. How do I know those numbers? Well, I would tell you this is basically a trial and error. Of course, if you have a look to the histogram of the data and so on, you can have a look to you can have a look to that and, and decide the numbers, or, or you could even uh, think about more uh, advanced techniques where you set that automatically. Of course, if I change my values, instead of putting 160, I put uh, 600, for example, and I run this again, you will see that the core stretch, of course, is going to change completely, and the visualization is also going to change. So as you can see, the way you put your thresholds is going to affect a lot your ability to see something. That's why if you, um, if you open an image directly in Python from SAR, maybe you will see something completely white or completely black, depending on on the um, color map you use. Anyway, let's leave it as I had it, and we can continue. Okay, so there we go. Okay, next step in our processing chain is going to be apply orbit file. So, few words here about the orbits in SAR imagery. So, the orbit state vectors provided in the metadata of a SAR product, as uh, you can see here are generally not accurate and can be refined with precise orbit files which are available days to week after the generation of the product. The orbit files, uh, the, orbit, the orbit file provided, provides accurate satellite position and velocity information. And based on this information, the orbit state vectors in the abstract metadata of the product are updated. What does that mean? Well, it means that when uh, an image is acquired from Sentinel-1, 
information about the position of the satellite is also acquired. This is relevant to, to the way a SAR system works. However, this information can be refined, can be improved days to, to weeks after, once the satellite completes its orbit and once the uh, calculations of the, the path the satellite has followed are redone. This information is done by ESA and is delivered to users automatically, and it can be accessed by users via SNAP using the apply orbit file operator. So this operator is going to connect, let's say, to the database where this information is available. It's going to check if new orbit information is available for our product. It's going to download that and update our metadata regarding the orbits. So the way to proceed in Snappy is the same. First of all, we open the parameters variable and we open an empty Snappy hash map object. We then use the put up, uh, method to pass the parameters of the applied orbit file um, operator. In this case, apply orbit file true. Again, go to GPT dash H, then the name of the operator, apply orbit file, to know the list of parameters that are needed or available. And once we have the parameters created, we just use the Snappy GPF create product. We put the name of the operator, in this case, apply orbit file, and pay attention here to the way it's written. We pass the parameters for that operator and we pass the product to which we want to apply this uh, operation. Once this is done, we just, I mean, once you have this, just run the code and it's going to tell you, in this case, I have a, here a confirmation message, orbit uh, updated successfully. It went quite fast, usually it goes very fast. Of course, I have run these exercises in advance, so the actual download of the orbits has already happened. It has gone into the um, folders of SNAP where this is stored, and that's why it was so fast. If it's the first time you are running uh, the apply orbit file, it might take a little bit more, but I'm not. It, it would be like seconds or so. It's not. It's not very long. Okay. The next step in our processing chain is the thermal noise removal. So thermal noise in SAR imagery is the background energy that is generated by the receiver itself. Skews the radar reflectivity towards higher values and hampers the precision of radar reflectivity estimates. Level 1 products provide a noise lookup table for each measurement data set provided in linear power and which can be used to remove the noise from the product. So what does that mean? It means that by default, since we're using an active sensor, uh, the system is generating some noise that is, let's say, captured by, by, the, by the antenna, let's say, and it's uh, introducing a noise in our measurements. Uh, since the, uh, the sensor and the satellite is uh, known and is calibrated before being sent to space, we know which is this increment that is happening in the data due to the inherent noise, and we can remove it using the lookup tables that are available in each data set. Of course, this noise will be more visible in those areas where you have a low uh, backscatter. So, for example, over oceans, over water bodies, and so on, usually radar signal is very low. And there you might see the effect of that. Over land, it will be more difficult for you to see it. But anyway, it's good procedure to remove that from your data. So how do we do it? Well, you can see it starts to be the same. We open parameters, snappy hash map, empty uh, object. Remember, hash map is like a, a Java object that is like a Python dictionary. We pass the, uh, the parameters for this specific operator that we can get from GPT. In this case, remove thermal noise, true. So meaning we want to really remove it. And then we just call snappy GPF, create product, the name of the operator, the, the parameters we want to pass, and the product to which we want to apply it. In this case, apply orbit file, which is this one here. Okay, once we do so, we uh, plot it using our function. In this case, I'm going to show you intensity, VV, and VH. And again, you can see here the values I'm using for the color stretching. Okay, let's run it and have a look to the result. Again, I'm, uh, I'm, I want you to think about the core stretch and the application this has on the visualization we are having. Well, this is the result for intensity, VV, and VH. And well, you can, I mean, it's not that visible, but of course we know already that the, we have removed the inner noise caused by uh, 
this uh, system. Okay, once we do the thermal noise removal, we are ready for the next step, which is kind of uh, mandatory, I would say, or it is mandatory in, in SAR processing, which is radiometric calibration. So I have here a small text describing uh, what it is for those of you that don't know it. So the objective of SAR calibration is to provide imagery in which the pixel values can be directly related to the radar backscatter of the scene. So uncalibrated SAR imagery is sufficient for qualitative use, but calibrated SAR images are essential to quantitative use of SAR data. Typical SAR data processing, which produces level one images, does not include radiometric correction and significant radiometric bias remains. That means that radiometric correction has to be done on the user's side uh, in this way. So the radiometric correction is necessary for the pixel values to truly represent the radar backscatter of the reflecting surface and therefore for comparison of SAR images acquired with different sensors, but also from images acquired from the same sensor but at different times or in different modes or processed by different processing uh, baselines. So this is really a fundamental step. Um, if you're new to radar, I would recommend you to check SAR theory in, 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 on, on what radiometric calibration is and how it's done. There are different variables that you can extract from, from here. In our case, we are going to use the one that reflects the, uh, the true backscatter coefficient per unit of area. So the uh, backscatter coefficient is known as uh, sigma naught, but there are others, there are beta and gamma, which relate to other characteristics of the scene. So again, and just to point this again, uh, just to point, point this out again, if you want to know which are the parameters that you need to pass to calibration, you need to, I would recommend you, there are other ways to do it in, in, with Snappy in Python, but I think this is the easiest way. You just go to uh, GPT and you write um, GPT-H and then followed by the name of the operator we want to consult, in this case, calibration. And here we will access the list of operators. So you see it here, parameter options. So for example, we have uh, create uh, beta band, if you're interested on, the, on that one. In our case, we're interested in uh, sigma band, the backscatter back coefficient, and so on. So this is a list of parameters. Some of them have a default value. Uh, some of us not in, in, our, in other operators. So if we go back now to our calibration step, you can see that we are setting these parameters. Output sigma band true. That means that we want to output the uh, sigma band, uh, the sigma not uh, uh, coefficient. We are giving as input the intensity VH and the intensity VV from the previous product that we are going to pass, the thermal noise. We want to do it for both polarizations, VV and VH and VV. So here you can see already a way to uh, get rid of one polarization if you want. And then we are saying, OK, the output image scale in decibels is set to false. I don't want to convert my values to decibels in this case. You could do it if, if you want, or either here or in a separate operation. There is a specific operator in SNAP for decibel conversion. So we have our parameters. And again, as you can see, this starts to be familiar. SNAP EGPF create product, name of the operator, parameters of the operator, product to which we want to apply the, uh, the um, analysis. And then we use our dedicated function to visualize the result. So let's have a look to this. And let's see how it looks like. So as you can see, I'm running the code live. So I'm not uh, skipping processing times. And you can see it's, I would say, kind of fast. Of course, I'm working in a subset and, and everything. But yeah, I, I think it's, it's quite good. So sigma. VV and VH, we don't have any more intensity or amplitude. So now we can start to relate products to each other and we can start to do comparisons. The next step in uh, our processing chain, if you remember here, so uh, this is so far what we have done. Subset, apply orbit file, thermal noise calibration. So now it's speckle filtering. Speckle filtering is um, yeah, a very common topic in, in SAR. And the idea of speckle filter is to reduce this 
kind of salt and pepper effect you can see in SAR imageries, in which you have pixels that are close to each other and that have very different uh, values. This is something that is inherent to the fact of using a, an active sensor. It's the coherent noise that is coming back and something that you have to deal with when working with SAR imageries. There are different techniques that, that, uh, you, can, that you can use and uh, I want here to introduce you to speckle filtering. So SAR images have an inherent salt and pepper-like texturing that, that is called speckle, which degrades the quality of the image and makes interpretation of features more difficult. Speckles are caused by random constructive and destructive interference of the D-phase but coherent return waves scattered by the elementary scatters within each resolution cell. Speckle noise reduction can be applied either by spatial filtering or multi-look processing. Uh, for you to know, GRD products are already multi-looked. Anyway, you could even do more multi-look in the image. And in that way, you would reduce speckle filter, but also you will lose spatial resolution. So when doing multi-look, you can, you can reduce the speckle, but always think that you will lose uh, the spatial resolution of your product. In the, on the other way, if you do a speckle filtering, you will not lose um, the special resolution, but of course you will be changing uh, also the um, pixel values, the original pixel values. So, again, uh, parameters, hash map, we put it here, the different parameters, we call the speckle filter uh, operator of SNAP, we pass the parameters, the calibrated product, and we visualize it. Here, I want to have a look to the parameters with you in uh, GPT so that you uh, see the options that you have to do speckle filtering in, uh, in SNAP. By default in SNAP, there is um, a specific um, algorithm that is used for speckle filtering, but of course there are many more and there are a lot of parameters that you can play with. So I would recommend you, if you're interested on, on this and to know more, to check literature on the different speckle filters that are available, which ones are good for what, uh, and, and so on. In here, you can see in the parameters option, you have the uh, filter option, the, the filter parameter. And you can see that in, uh, in SNAP, you, have, you can either do none, so no, no filtering, and you have to give the different um, models, let's say Boscar, Median, Frost, Gamma Map, Lee, Refined Lee, uh, Lee Sigma, etc. Again, if you look for literature, for papers on, on this topic, you will find, you can get to the, let's say, the, the formulas behind those filters and how they actually work. Usually, since there are special filters, they require some kind of uh, moving window settings uh, to be defined by the user and, and so on. Anyway, you can see here the, the list of that. Okay, so let's run the speckle filter and Again, here you can see how our values are, how the values we are using to stretch our color are changing. If you remember at the beginning, we were using, of course, it was uh, amplitude, so we were using values that were very high. Now we are in the range of 0 to 0 0.21 and so on. Well, here we get uh, this uh, the result. Um, yeah, it's not the best way to compare. Again, think about the, the color stretch implications. Um, but yeah, uh, in this way you can explore with this visualization the um, the changes in in this. Actually, I think we could. I was just paying attention to the values. We could put the same values as in the um, previous step, so that we can visually see the the difference. Okay. So again, here I'm just using the same color stretch as before, so that we can visually compare. Uh, the outputs and see the effect of, of this speckle filter. Of course, we are just visualizing the images in Python here. They are not very big. We are not uh, zooming into the pixel level. So, of course, this is a programming environment. So, the idea here is not to be very interactive with the data, but just to define some scripts to run some processes that we already know and then we explore the, the, the final result, right? But yeah, well, here you have the the visualizations with the same uh, score stretch, just going to show you the previous one. And I think it, especially here around here, I think it worked 
uh, very well. Okay, so we have our speckle filter done. We have corrected a little bit the speckle. Remember, you cannot get rid of speckle noise in SAR images. You can reduce it. Uh, there are different techniques, it's, for example, multi temporal speckle filtering and so on, but you cannot get rid of it completely. Okay, so we are ready for the last step of our processing chain, which is the rain correction. So here, <clears throat> very briefly, uh, due to topographical variations of a scene and the tilt of the satellite sensor, distances can be distorted in the SAR images. Image data not directly at the sensor's native location will have some distortions. Terrain corrections are intended to compensate for those distortions so that the geometric representation of the image will be as close as possible to the real world. So it's in this step where we are going to put together the image with them and we are going to relate uh, that in order to have an image that and, and values that represent as much as possible the actual top, topography of the terrain. At the same time, SAR images have some uh, distortions. I'm just thinking about shadow effects, for shortening, layover. I mean, if you have worked with, with radar already, you know about these things and the effects uh, it has. So how do we do terrain correction in Snappy? Well, actually, it's exactly the same way. The only difference is that here you might see much more parameters. First of all, I am creating a variable that is called proj for projection, which contains the, uh, the, the information about the projection I'm going to use. As you can see, I'm using UTM projection, zone 31, and well, here are all those parameters. So the question here is, well, how do I know, basically, how do I know this? How do I know that I'm in zone 31 or 33 or whatever? Well, there are different tricks here you can do, um, different ways to find for this information. I think the easiest, and let's say it's kind of a workaround solution, is that you take advantage of the feature in SNAP, in the GUI of SNAP, where you can detect automatically the UTM zone in the uh, terrain correction operator. Uh, if you don't know about what I'm, what I'm talking about, I recommend you to check previous Rus Copernicus webinars where we use the graphical interface of SNAP and where I show you uh, this interaction with the GUI. If you go to the GUI and you um, create a, a chain with uh, this step and your data, you can then access the XML document of that chain and actually retrieve from there this information about the uh, projection parameters. So it's just a workaround solution that I would suggest you, not the only. Okay, so again, we create a hash map object from Snappy. We start to pass the parameters according to the list of parameters of the terrain correction operator. So in this case, the dem that we are going to use, the resampling method for the image, the pixel spacing, the map projection. So in this case, map projection is the name of the parameter, and I'm just pointing to my variable here, proj. Then I'm saying that I don't want to mask areas without elevation. This is a setting that in Snap is set by default to true, so it will remove uh, like water areas, uh, so, sorry, ocean areas. I'm setting it to false because I want to keep that still. And I'm, I say that I want to save the select source band. So basically I want to get as I get an out get as output my input bands. If we run this, let's run it because this is the only step that takes a little bit more than the previous ones. Um, of course, I would say from the complete processing chain we are running today, it's the one that uh, is more demanding in terms of processing. So while it runs, I'm going to continue and uh, because we are basically at the end of the exercise. The last step, as you can see here, is the write operator. So how does that work in Snappy? It's very easy. It's very similar to the read operator. First of all, instead of pointing to a folder where we have our original data, now we have to point to the folder where we want to save our output. And also, we need to give a name to that output. So you can see here, I'm declaring an out path name variable that contains the path where I want to save this, out, this output that I'm generating. And it contains the name. Of course, in Python, you could think about different strategies to name your products. You could automatize this, link, link it to some of the variables, and, and so on, and make it more automatic. And that's totally fine, and it's very easy to do. But I want to keep the, um, the, um, 
the, the demo simple so that you focus on the use of Snappy and not in nice Python tricks, let's say. Okay, so um, once you declare the output path and name, then you just need to tell uh, Snappy to write the product to, a, to file, to, to the disk. And for that, we call the uh, Snappy product IO write product function. You remember at the uh, beginning, instead of using write, we were using read. If I just go here, uh, you can remember, sorry, not here, but uh, yeah, here. So when we were importing the product in, in Python with Snappy, we were using snappy.productio.read product. In this case, it's on read, but write. Okay. So, ah, okay, we got our terrain corrected products back. <coughs> sorry. So you see, Sigma VV, Sigma VH, they are now projected in UTM. If you are familiar with the coast of the Netherlands, this is actually how it should be oriented. If you remember our previous products, they were turned over completely. But that's totally fine. Usually in SAR, you want to keep the SAR geometry until the very last moment. You only want to reproject your, your products when you want to, I don't know, ingest it with um, all the layers or combine it with all the data. But when you're working in, in in a SAR environment, let's say, you want to give to the original uh, acquisition geometry as much as possible. Okay, so here we we got it. Uh, it is projected. We have a background value, which uh, remember, I'm just I'm just pointing out some features that that might be uh, relevant for you. This is already a product that can be used as input to any application, whether it's uh, Urban mapping, uh, water body mapping, ship detection, I don't know, whatever you do. And as I said, now we wanted to write this to disk. So, okay, I already explained this. So we say write product, which product? The terrain correction product, the one here. Where? In this uh, path and with this name. Which format? Geotiff. Remember, Snap is. Uh, has a long list of compatible write formats, so not only GeoTiff, you could keep the, the original uh, Sentinel format, which is the Bindi map, the, the standard for, for Snap and, and Sentinel. But yeah, you, you can basically choose the, the one you want in the list of available formats in Snap. Okay, so let's do so. And just uh, adding here a confirmation message. And I want to show you uh, this now. Well, basically, this takes a little bit. Since the data is uh, large, it's going to be around 360 megabytes. And we have to write that to the disk. Um, so I just want to show you that this is actually working. Um, so you, sorry, you uh, see here, I'm writing my file in this specific folder. So I'm going to access this folder in my file manager. It's here, processing. Snappy, and you can see, well, I have a backup because I've done this in advanced. But basically, you can see this is a write I'm writing. And why do I know that it's being written? Well, basically, if you check the properties of the file here below, you see its size and it's increasing. Right now, it's around uh, 101 megabytes. And if we just wait a few seconds, you see it's increasing. Well, the one I have as backup is 360 megabytes. So we would need to wait until this reaches the, the full size. So what I, what I want to tell you here is basically the write operation is working. Once it, uh, it's finished, we will get a confirmation, a confirmation message. But while we wait, I want to show you that this actually works. This is a valid method, of course, to, to process our data and to use Snappy and Python. And this gives you an output that you can then ingest in a Snap in any other Earth observation software as a, any other GOT file in a GIS software like QGIS or maybe continue the processing in Python or in R or wherever you want, basically. And to demonstrate that, I have here Snap open already. I have opened my, my file. And well, basically, you can see it here uh, as any other import in Snap. You can access the bands folder. We have VV and VH. See, I mean, um, I, you can just zoom into the pixel level. We see a ship around here, some urban areas, some fields, uh, but very nice area seen by SAR here in the Netherlands. A good thing of this 
is that not only you get the data, but also you get all the metadata, which is, I think, very important. You get the abstract metadata of the Sentinel original product. So all the information you might want to know, it was an ascending pass, well, I don't know, all this information that might be relevant for you. But not only you get the abstract metadata, but also you get the uh, metadata about the processing that this product has been through. If we go to processing graph, you can see here the different nodes. Those are the different, let's say, steps in our processing chain. For example, if we add, uh, I don't know, node four, uh, just open it. You see this is the speckle filter, and we can, for example, access the parameters that we have used. So we use the leaf filter with a seven by seven window size and, and so on. I think this is great since then you, whenever someone gives you a product process in this, in this way, <coughs> sorry, you can go back and see actually what has happened and maybe you can comment on it and give your opinion and things like that. Okay, so VH, uh, also to demonstrate again that this is a uh, way of processing the file that this uh, way of processing the Kubernetes data in a way that it's compatible with all the software. Instead of using the backup now, let's use the um, the one we have just written, and you can just add it into uh, QGIS, and basically you will get it. So now, what's happening? <laughs> if you see this and you say, "Oh my God, I, that, that it went wrong," uh, we have to start again. This thing that Miguel was telling is not true. Well, always think about the color and the color stretch that is happening in the product, in, in your product. Most probably, I mean, I didn't check it myself, but yeah, most probably you have to go into the, the way you are setting the, the min and max value here, and you just need to change that. Um, we can set maybe the ones we were using, let's say, for example, user define from zero to, I think in JupyterLab we were using, 0 0.5, okay, 0 0.5. Let's see if it works. <laughs> no. And let me see again if I didn't, ah, sorry, yeah, because we're in a multi-band color. So this is not a multi-band color, it's, um, it's a single band, so select single band. Of course, if we use the standard uh, values for min and max, we still get a black and white, uh, sorry, a black image. If we change the, the values, 0.5, apply, we start to see something. Of course, this is how QJS deals with the color, so it's something that you, I think it was 0.5, not. Ah. Okay, there we go. Okay, you see it works in QJS. Uh, don't be scared if you get a uh, yeah, black image. Just think a little bit about what's happening and why, and, and then you can uh, get your work around. Okay, so um, works. So let me close this. And let me close this also. Okay, so you see, um, well, here we got the, the confirmation. So this is basically the end of the exercise. So you have seen how easy it is to I would say process Copernicus data using Snappy. I think it's a very convenient way for those of you that are already in an operational use of the data, or for those of you that uh, want to automatize your processing chains uh, for your projects. And I think it's it's a great way. So let let me now move to my presentation back just to finalize finalize the um, the talk, and then we go to the Q and A session, and we share some thoughts. Okay, so let's move on now to some final thoughts about this session. So here I'm leaving you with some links and references to the tools that we have used. First of all, I recommend you to check the official documentation of Snappy, which is very well documented and where you will find all the instructions to have this module installed and, and ready to use. And also if you are new to Anaconda and Jupyter Notebooks, I leave you here with the official websites where you can basically go through, through them and, and get to know more. Okay, so and just some final thoughts. So with the new Sentinel satellites, the challenge in satellite remote sensing is no longer data availability, but rather how to store and process all the information. In addition to that, it is necessary to explain how the data can be used and support users in their applications. 
The Rus Copernicus service is here to solve those problems, and we do so by providing virtual machines to store and process the data, such as what we have done today, and also by offering a dedicated help desk to support users, uh, and which is backed up by a team of remote sensing experts. So let's now move on to the Q&A session. I'm just going to close now the, the webinar session before moving on. And for that, I'm leaving you with the um, websites of the project, also with uh, the social media of the project. If you want to stay updated with upcoming deadlines, courses, and webinars, and, and so on, I recommend you, you follow us on either Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. So thank you, everybody, for joining this session. I hope you have learned something new today about the processing Copernicus data in a Python environment using Python. And I hope it, this will be useful for your projects and research. So I will move now to the Q&A session and I wish you uh, a good afternoon for the rest. Thank you, bye.